Hey, how do you doodly do? My name is Roger and since I'm not able to go sailing in the Mediterranean right now like I'm supposed to do, I would like to show you some of my home country, Norway. In previous episodes I've been north in Lofoten and Vesterolen. Now I have returned to the southern Norway in Telemark. Today I will show you some war history from World War II that is not only important to Norway but to the world as we know it. In the next episode I will take you to Rjukan, a valley so narrow with mountains so steep that they actually placed a mirror on a mountain top to reflect the sunshine down into the valley. This was where the fertilizer was made and thereby the heavy water later used to make the nuclear bomb was discovered. But in this episode we will cover the sinking of the railway ferry going out from this valley transporting the heavy water on its way to Nazi Germany. So come along! Yes, I'm on my way to Ryukan and uh, this ferry named Ammonia is the sister ship of the ferry that was sunk by the uh, Allied when it was transporting heavy water for Germany uh, that was gonna be used for making nuclear weapons. So this is a piece of history, not this boat was sunk but one exactly like it. Now I'm gonna go see if they have any guides available, so maybe I can come on board and have a closer look. <laughs> this is this is Ammonia, <laughs> and it's the sister ship ferry of the Hydro. It's indeed the sister of uh, Hydro, who was sunk during the war. Yeah. Uh, Ammonia is the world's biggest steam uh, train ferry, in fact. Oh really? Uh, of this type. Uh, and there are only four left in the world. Yeah. So this was, this was not transporting cars at all, it's just trains? No, only trains. Yeah. We have in fact transported cars on uh, the other boat, uh, Sturigut, uh, at one point, but she's a diesel ferry, so it's, you know... Yeah, whatever. okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So when you're coming aboard now, you can see it's a pretty big boat. Yes. Considering it can in fact carry 16 train carriages. Yeah. And uh, right now we don't have the rails on because we are restoring the boat. Okay. Because uh, we do hope to be able to drive trips with tourists. Yeah. On this boat. Oh cool. It is kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> and of course she's just a part in a longer story uh, yeah. of, uh, of uh, transport history. Uh, which spans from 1907 until today. Yeah. Because that's when the rail were, railway was built. Yeah. Um, and Ammonia is the third boat that we got. Because the first one we got in 1909, and her name was Rukanfos. Same kind of boat, but half the size, just about. But she wasn't enough. So already in 1914, we got the second one. And that's the slightly more familiar DF Hydro. Which were sunk. Which was sunk indeed. Yeah. And um, uh, once we got ammonia in 1929, quite a bit later, uh, it was ammonia and hydro who took the trip back and forth uh, from this end to the other end of the lake. What's in the other end of the lake? Well, it's the other end of the railway. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that's a town called Notodden. There is also a town called Nordhavn, hmm? although you need to take the train from Tinnose all the way out to Nordhavn. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So it's uh, it's about 30 kilometers on the lake and then 30 kilometers on railway. Then you'll reach Nordhavn. Yeah. Uh, and uh, of course, the ferries also ran back and forth during the war. Normal transport. The biggest difference was that uh, they didn't have any coal. So they used normal uh, firewood for, for heating uh, the steam uh, engines. Hmm. Um, but then of course... What kind of goods were they transporting back then? They were transporting, uh, transporting fertilizer yeah? for the most part, because that is what was being made at Rukam. Yeah. Uh, it was synthetic fertilizer, the first synthetic fertilizer in the world. 
which was quite nice to have because everyone was dying of hunger at the time. Yeah. And then suddenly they discovered something named heavy water. They did indeed, because they switched the way they made the synthetic fertilizer. And when they did that, they needed uh, they needed uh, hydro uh, hydrogen gas. Uh, so they made a hydrogen gas factory. Uh, that word's so difficult to say correctly. Um, uh, up at Vermuk. Yeah. And what they did was electrolysis of water, which means you just send a lot of uh, electricity into water, so you split H2O into H and O separately. But heavy water is more tightly bound, which means you technically need more electricity to split it. So with the normal amount of electricity being used, heavy water remained. Because it is, in fact, in all water, just yeah. in very, very small amounts. Oh, really? Yes. Mm. And uh, so it was discovered, well, there's water that isn't doing what it's supposed to. That's strange. Let's use it to make coffee. How, did, how did they discover this? Do you know that? No, it, it just remained a bit from the electrolysis. Because te technically everything was supposed to turn into gas, but some strange water remained. And that was the heavy water. So it took a couple of years of trying and testing out. Uh, but uh, an American scientist by the name of Harold Urey uh, is the one who discovered, um, called it deuterium oxide or heavy water. Mm. Obviously, because it's about 10% heavier than normal water. And. Um, this was used for a variety of things, sciencey things, and then someone got the idea to make an atomic bomb with it, which was an ideal, mm. because this was the only place it was being made. Yeah. So um, uh, Nazi Germany took over the entire place, uh, and they started. Yes, because this was in 1940s. Yeah, in the in yeah. the 1940s. Yeah. Um, and so they took over the entire place and started producing a lot of heavy water. Um, and some of the Allies heard what was going on and so there were several sabotage operations going on. Hmm. And the third one, the American bombing, scared the uh, Nazi Germans a lot. So then they decided they wanted to move their entire production to Germany. But to do that they needed to bring the heavy water and some of the equipment this transport route which meant it needed to be moved by the boats. Yeah. And so the uh, saboteurs that have been in the area got a new task. You need to stop that transport. And the most efficient way to do that would be to sink the boat. Because they knew that the lake is more than 400 meters deep. And so, the evening before the ship was set to sail, the saboteurs snuck aboard. And it wasn't very difficult, because it was quite normal for people to sleep over on the deck if they were going with the morning ferry. So they just pulled their hats a bit low and said, good, good night, good evening. And once everything was silent, they snuck down into the front of the boat. There, they planted an explosive. And the mechanism that was set to make it go off was in fact the alarm clock of the grandmother of one of the saboteurs. <laughs> one of these old ones with the bells. Yeah. So that was set to ring about an hour after the boat had set out. So it was not a suicide action? No. No. It was uh, cleverly planned. Yeah. Uh, even if they were not entirely happy about it because there were going to be passengers on the boat. And they were told by London, you need to sink this boat. Hmm. So they did. And so they stayed, they remained on the boat. No, once they had planted everything and were sure it was going to work, they fled. Hmm. And the next day, the ferry went uh, off as planned. And had a reasonable uh, trip until they reached Rutsgrem, which is about an hour by yeah. the by the boat. At that point they heard a humongous booming noise. And the captain and his crew, they were looking around. What was that? Did we did we hit some ice? Because it was February. Mm. So it could have been ice, but they couldn't see anything. 
and of course they couldn't see anything because the hole was under the waterline. But one thing that also had happened with that hole was that it had destroyed one of the steam um, pipes. So hot, hot steam streamed into the passenger place under the deck. Um, the people under there didn't drown, to say it like that. Oh. They burnt to death. Yeah. How many people died? All together, 14 civilians and four German soldiers. Nobody made it alive? They did. Yeah? Because what happened was that the boat, it started rocking dangerously. It took in water very quickly and they realized something's terribly, terribly wrong. You all need to jump into the lake. Yeah. And in February. Uh, in February. And if you jump into that cold water, you can get shock and just stop. Yeah. But um, what also happened was that there were farmers living along the sides of the lake and they heard and saw something going on. Yeah. So they tossed themselves out into their rowboats to pick up as many people as possible from the freezing water. Yeah. And by doing that, they saved 28 people. 28? Yeah. yeah. So more people did, in fact, survive than did die. 20, 28 died, 14 survived. Other way around. <laughs> yeah, other way around. Two thirds survived. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Matt was not my. Uh... I don't like maths much either. <laughs> I, there's a reason I do history. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. But uh, but yeah, the the ferry itself just slipped under the waterline and disappeared, and it sank uh, in ten minutes, which is very quickly for that big a boat. Hmm. But it's, uh, it's reasonable, uh, because it was placed so that it would take in as much water as possible, as quickly as possible. Because they didn't want to risk it lying in the waterline and being able to be towed mm. to land. Mm. Because then it would have been for nothing. I read on Wikipedia that they actually went down and got up a barrel of heavy water a few years ago, is that right? They did! Yeah. Because in 1993, someone got the idea to look for the boat, because we had no idea where it was, other than somewhere over there. Yeah. Uh, so they used an uh, ROV, remote operated vehicle, and found the boat at 430 meters deep. Uh, and using more of these remote operated things, uh, they picked up two barrels to test if this was really heavy water. Because after the war, someone had said, no, 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 there wasn't heavy water on the boat. That entire thing was unnecessary. But we tested it, and it was heavy water. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, otherwise it would have been kind of not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the saboteurs were given a cold shoulder up in town the, the rest of their lives by the people that knew they had been involved in this okay. so-called accident. And that was naturally because people from this uh, area died. They did. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to know that intellectually you have, to, you have to do this mathematics of how many human lives might, yeah. might die if I do or if I don't. And something else to know, it's your fault. I've lost someone. Yeah. That's so easy to accept it's i can imagine that must be hard but they also say that this sabotage action was maybe one of the most important during all of world war ii it was one of them mm. and uh, the operation uh, the operation that happened earlier the the uh, february in 1943 was also quite important in slowing everything down yeah and that operation being named gunnerside uh, which was with the saboteurs climbing down the mountainside to get mm. to Vemwick. Mm. And that one is also very well known because uh, it was extremely successful with no loss of life and not even a single shot fired. That's amazing. It is pretty amazing. Yes. So they, they, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. And the craziest thing is they were so young. These people were in their young 20s. Yes. I do believe the youngest one was 23. The youngest was 23? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And they did all this. Yeah. And that says a lot. They had courage. They very much did. Yeah. Okay. Is it possible to come up in the wheelhouse on this boat? Yes, we can. Yeah, good. We also have some, uh, we also have some uh, somewhat special salons on this boat. Oh. 
because uh, she is meant to impress. So we will head inside here. So this is the salon for first place or first class, as it might also be called. And uh, it's quite exclusive, because uh, when we first got to boat, a ticket a pair cost about a year's wages for a normal worker. What? Yeah, <laughs> a whole year's wages to sit in the fancy salon. One trip, one way. One trip. <laughs> that tells a lot about the class differences of the time. Yeah. Because we did have a lot of a class system up here for a very, very long time, which was uh, kind of special. Yeah. But everything here is also handmade. So you can't take a part from one side of this boat and put it somewhere else because it won't fit. Hmm. But uh, there's also the, uh, the leader's salon, which is even better. Because in here, there's even more decoration, and there's the pictures. So in here, you could only come if you were invited. And that lasted until they closed the passenger trips in 1970. What? <laughs> yeah, people were mad about that. <laughs> but it was, it was so exclusive. That it's is been... so not Norwegian, so not Scandinavian at all. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but uh, Hydro was very, uh, was very um, inspired by, by um, international practices mm. in a lot of ways. Uh, and and it was an international company. It was. Yeah. So, so a lot of the things they did seem very strange now. Yeah, I, I can imagine that they also had a lot of business connections coming here. They did. Yeah. Um, and we've, we've even had royals come mm. visit here. Mm. And sit in these salons. Yeah. So in here... You Anyone we know? Um, uh, well, I mean, we did have the... We did have King Håkon uh, back in the start of the century. Mm. Um, and also we had a sheikh uh, of... I can't remember. The, they changed the country name at some point. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also his wife, uh, Princess Faradiba. So uh, they were people that came visiting at one point. Oh. Cool. So it's uh, kind of uh, surprising because it's such a small, tiny place in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> so, of course, in here you can also be served dinner. Uh, and then afterwards you sit in there and with a cigar and a glass of cognac and just relax and talk about the important part in life, namely money. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a uh, very, very special... Uh, sort of place. Cool. But we can also head. Uh, we can also head for the um, for the um, steering house or whatever mm. it's actually called. Wheelhouse. Yeah. That. Also, there was even a little office if someone wanted to do a bit of work. Yeah. <laughs> Good. And you can also see the. There's like hand, uh, handwork in a lot of things, uh, and also like even in just the floor. Mm -hmm. and it's all everything's all crooked because uh, they wanted the water to fall off, obviously. Yeah, naturally. Oh yeah. So the wheelhouse didn't have, it wasn't up front like, like here, so. Yeah, no. You had, uh, you had the steering wheel in there with all of the uh, gyroscopes and uh, whatnot. Uh, and then you had the machine uh, contact uh, yeah. out in front here. So if you wanted to change the speed of the engine, you'd have to be out here and go, I want to go half speed front. And then they saw that message down in the machine room, fixed everything and went, yep, we're going half speed front now. 
So that means there had to be two navigators on the bridge yes. at any time? Uh, there were always two, usually uh, three yeah. people working out there. Hmm. And uh, we even had a very nice simple way if you wanted to contact the machine room. This, yeah. uh, this pipe goes all the way down. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you could just talk into it. <laughs> <laughs> These are nice. It's a, it's a very simple but effective way of, of communicating and getting things done really. Yeah. And Hydro, of course, was very similarly built uh, up in the top there. So you can imagine them hearing this boom and looking out like, what on earth was that? Mm. Of course. And here is the, uh, this is the uh, gas pressure or is it the... Uh... Um, no. I think it's the um, uh, two drop? Yeah, it's the RPMs. Yeah, that's what said on that. <laughs> and uh, the, the fun part with this entire boat is that the entire thing runs on steam. Mm. Uh, from the electricity to the engines to absolutely everything. Which means that you need to heat it properly. So if you want to get anywhere with this boat, you need to fire the, the uh, cauldrons, the boilers, for 20 hours. 20 hours. Yep. So uh, if we uh, eventually get her up and running, uh, it'll probably be for like one week straight mm. that, ah, now there are trips with ammonia. Yeah. Because otherwise it's just ridiculous to use two days to make a one day trip. That must mean that when it was running, uh, scheduled running, it was never cold. Very true. Yeah. People uh, usually had uh, 12 hour shifts working on the boats and the train. Mm. So it was always kept going on and on and on. Mm. So it's uh, quite, quite interesting. Mm. But uh, it's definitely much easier to start Sturegut, the diesel ferry, because it only takes one hour to get her ready to go. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Sturegut is actually, she was extremely modern when we got her oh. in 1956. So she even has uh, propellers in the front. She was one of the first boats, big boats, in Norway to get that. Hmm. Which is kind of cool. So it can go both ways? Uh, well, she can't quite go both ways, uh, but it allows her to move sideways, essentially. Yeah. Uh, which makes it much easier to come into land, because we have, uh, when, uh, when we're wanting to get the boats in, you can see there are two points in front, mm. uh, and we have two locks on uh, on uh, the the uh, connection to land so which means you need to hit those so they can lock on hmm. uh, and with this boat if you missed you'd had to back out and then try again whereas with Sturigud you can just adjust her sideways yeah so it's a bit easier <laughs> it also means that if we do get her running we are going to need to get uh, specialized people to uh, drive the boat mm. because uh, it's not something just anyone can do. Oh, okay. <laughs> but you also told me before that uh, this is a sister ship of uh, uh, the boat Hydro that was sunk, but it's much bigger, right? It's much bigger. Uh, hydro could take 10 to 12 uh, carriages, train carriages, whereas Ammonia can take 16 to 17. Mm. So she is. Uh, I'm not quite sure just how many meters, but she's at least five to ten meters bigger mm. altogether. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's the train stoppers. Yep. <laughs> and there is Turgut. It doesn't look that much bigger for its name. Sturigut means big boy, huh? Yeah, it does. Huh? Uh, she was given the name uh, from, uh, from a poem, actually, uh, about a guy who got called uh, Sturigut because he was so big and strong. Uh, it's a poem by a, uh, a man named Osmund um, Olofsson Linje. So uh, when they got Sturigut, uh, Hydro actually said, all right, let's make uh, let's make a bit of fun out of it. People, please give us uh, names, and the one who wins will get a prize. Uh, and so two people actually had the same idea, 
uh, and they got to share the price of 50 uh, kroner. <laughs> 50 kroner? Yeah. That was a lot of money back then. It was quite a lot of money back then. Yeah. Today, it's about a cup of coffee. Yeah, <laughs> our cups of coffee cost 25 yeah? It's yeah. like, oh, that's, that's a lot for a cup of coffee. Oh, that's, that's not very much, it's actually. It's not very much. If you go, if you go to, uh, like, a gas station, it's gonna be, like, at least 30, but... Yeah. But, yeah, no, Storygood is uh, Northern Europe's uh, biggest inland ferry. Really? Yeah. Then let's go have a look at it. <laughs> Okay, as we were boarding Sturgut, she came with some new information and she has to repeat that for us. <laughs> well, what I say was that this lake being regulated uh, actually has a difference in its lowest height and tallest height of four meters. Which of course means that uh, you can't actually have a, uh, a land gang thing that is uh, just stuck. So we have this big green thing here which is called the gallows uh, and with that we can lift and lower this entire thing so that it always meets the ferry and there are uh, that was early yeah and there are only two of it in the world the other one is on the other side of the lake oh really but now the lake must be about the highest point then no no <laughs> it's about halfway right now so we can come up two meters more uh, oh, really? at, uh, at uh, the most, uh, when you look at look at the uh, when you look at the edge with the uh, with the rocks and the moss, mm. it can actually be above the moss. Really? Yes. And then we all get very concerned <laughs> <laughs> because then things keep flooding everywhere. <laughs> but you can regulate it. We can, but of course, uh, Mersvatten is regulated above mm. us, mm. Uh, and if we just let go of our water we're gonna flood shame <laughs> hmm. which is bad <laughs> could uh, be we, we did we did have a flood a couple of years back uh, and then we had to just keep flooding ourselves because shame was already flooded uh, and like they had uh, they had restaurants down by the seaside and stuff and they kept being just full of water <laughs> so it was a complete mess <laughs> Oh. But um, well, the boats don't care, they float. Yeah, that's the good thing about boats. We love boats, don't we? Storygood <laughs> uh, um, uh, is actually meant to carry so much weight that if you don't have any weight, uh, any carriages on board, she is just floating on top of the water, basically, uh, with her propellers not properly down in the water. Yeah. So if you don't have any weight on her, you're just gonna drift off. Uh, which is why there's a couple of uh, train carriages on her right now because she was on a trip uh, last week hmm. now this of course is a bit more modern a ferry mm -hmm. um, but still with the uh, rails because they were all only meant for uh, train transport Cars were getting more popular as time came, but we only had the road on the other side for a very long time. Uh, we didn't get the road on this side, which is the only good road in the entire place uh, until 1992. That's not long ago. It's not. No? Uh, we got it uh, as a response to this uh, entire uh, railway uh, and boats being, uh, being shut down. Yeah, there's no trains running here now. Uh, only the tourist trains that we run. Yeah. So we have uh, small, small historical train trips on Tuesdays and Fridays this summer. It changes a bit every summer, but uh, we try to keep up uh, having these train trips. Yeah. And then we also have the guided tours on the boats. Yeah. So how long does these train trips uh, take? Uh, about 35 minutes. So it's from Rukon station up in town and then down here. And usually one of us guides will be along with it and talk about uh, some of the history. But you don't take the trains on the ferry? No, no. Uh, we sometimes have uh, what we call uh, shifting days uh, at the end of August. And then we make a whole arrangement out of putting things on and off the, uh, off the ferry. Yeah. Uh, because it's uh, a bit of a production. Yeah, we're I not, can imagine. We're not really used to it because 
uh, you have to use uh, you have to use wires from the boat to hook on and pull and use uh, specific uh, shifting locomotives on the other end to push so it's a lot of uh, a lot of work complicated yeah, yeah especially when you're not used to it yeah although of course uh, at their most effective the people working here could come in with the boat get everything off get everything on and be out again in 20 minutes and when we're using the boat we use 15 minutes just getting into land <laughs> <laughs> they did it daily they did yeah there is something to said for practice yeah yeah <laughs> okay cool let's go inside and have a look at this one yes would you like to go downstairs or upstairs that's up to you <laughs> you lead the way Oh, I remember passenger salons like just like this from when I was a kid. They were exactly like this. Yes, yes, they very much were. Yeah. It's uh, that is sort of a fun thing because both ferries are very representative of the decade they were built in, mm. and this is literally how all ferries looked in the 50s and 60s. Yes. So we have a lot of guests coming, and they come down here, and they're like. Oh, but it's like this ferry and that ferry and I used to go on that ferry when I was a child. <laughs> Which is a lot of fun. So everybody says the same thing I did. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> That's so disappointing. Oh no. <laughs> well, it's kind of, it's quite nice. Yeah. Uh, although the not so nice part is that, um, as you can sort of hear, there's a lot of uh, acoustic mm. noise here. Mm. There's a lot of echo, and uh, all of our ferries are ice breakers mm. because there used to be a lot of ice on the uh, lake. Um, but that you break the ice doesn't mean it goes away, which yeah. means that of course it's scraped along the sides of the boat, which meant that sitting down here in the winter got noisy. And also you had a diesel engine. I can imagine that was also noisy. It's not surprisingly not that noisy. No. Uh, it's got uh, three 750 horsepower diesel engines. She's a uh, strong boat. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, she had to be a strong boat if she was going to break ice. Yeah. Yeah. The ice, uh, the ice can, uh, can be uh, one and a half meter thick uh, at the thickest. And it would still break through. Oh, yeah. These boats just like... <laughs> straight ahead. Oh, really? Did not care. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we also have two smaller salons. They're not restored yet. Mm. Uh, but there is the, uh, there's the uh, ladies salon. If you were a lady and you traveled alone and you wanted to be left alone. Uh, and then there's also the not smoking salon. But it was not like ladies had to sit there if they didn't. Uh, they no. didn't have to, luckily. No. Yeah. <laughs> but if they wanted a bit of peace. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I find it very amusing this concept of a not smoking salon. Yes. But of course, you could smoke wherever you wanted. And everybody smoked back then. I was told by a guest who uh, was here the other week uh, that she took this ferry when she was a young child uh, in uh, 1959. And walking down here, it was like walking through a cloud. Because mm. it was just smoke everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I can remember this from when I was a child. Yeah, I think yeah. it sounds absolutely terrible. So I'm glad I'm young enough not have to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. We can head up to the uh, first class salon. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, the smell. <laughs> yeah, it does smell. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, smells it smells like linoleum or something. Yes, yes, yes? it does. <laughs> well, this is the first class. This is first class. So it's a bit of a difference from the other boat. Yes. But it's still quite nice, especially with these big windows. Yeah, you got the view here. Very much. And, um, and the chairs are just like from a, a 50s restaurant in America or something. <laughs> yeah, they are original chairs. Yeah. We had to restore most of the salon because we discovered it had uh, water damage. So the, uh, the ceiling and the walls are new, but uh, the furniture is original.
Hm, cool. Yeah, you had good view from here. Salon in this boat too. Because of course they have. <laughs> yeah. And leaders were not officers on the ship. Nope. Nope. They were leaders of Hydro. Yes. So pretty much Hydro owned these boats, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Instead of the uh, false leather and uh, curtains again, of course. Curtains, that's important. <laughs> Very important. So it's a bit more space in here as well. Yeah, and here they could have dinner or. Yes. Yeah? Uh, on the first trip that Stuigu took, they had a three course dinner up here. Whereas down in uh, second class, they got a sandwich. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> Very typical. <laughs> Yeah, um, when, you, when you think what the tickets would have costed to sit up here. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, it was it was supposedly it was supposedly very nice because they had uh, prawns for uh, the first uh, course, and then they had reindeer uh, roast for the main course, and cloudberries for dessert. How Norwegian? How Norwegian? Yes, we love cloudberries. <laughs> And we're not talking. We're not talking cloudberries with cream. We're talking cloudberries with with just like milk. Because if you need cream, you don't have enough cloudberries. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I eat cloudberries for, for, for dessert every Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had cloudberries too, but we had them with cream cocktail. Oh. Yeah. With cream cocktail. Mm. That sounds nice. Krum cocker and cream. I mean, the cream can go, but I need to try it with krum cocker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can, uh, we can take a trip uh, up to the uh, the steering yeah? place. The wheelhouse. Yes, that. I keep forgetting that. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be a boat nerd. Yeah, I'm not a boat person. Yeah. I am. I am a histo history nerd yeah? who studies drama and theater. <laughs> and what's the kitchen named in a boat? Uh, that would be Bissu, wouldn't it? In, in, in English, it, yes, in Bissu is right. In Norwegian, in English, it's Galley. Ah, yes. <laughs> I, need to, I need to, like, read more pirate books or something. <laughs> this is kind of like I remember boats from my childhood. <laughs> They were old boats back then when I was a child. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. but I remember boats like this. Wow. This is so cool. Yeah, the biggest the biggest thing that's kind of sad is that we're missing the original wheel. <laughs> because so this one's very nice to steer with, but it's not the original. We yeah. used to have one of those big proper ones. But uh, when they shut the when they shut the uh, whole thing down in '91, the captain ran off with it. So we don't know where it is. <laughs> on his cabin. Presumably, <laughs> on the mantle of the fireplace or something. Yeah. But uh, everything is except the radars are not working, but everything else works. Yeah. So they didn't have RPMs, but they had. Full speed, half speed, slow, pretty slow. Uh, can't read this. Stop. <laughs> yeah, very, very easy to understand. Just do that thing. <laughs> yeah. And they had three engines, so they had three of these. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's also kind of special in this boat is that the captain can directly steer uh, the speed and back or forth uh, on uh, the two side engines with this. Hmm. Uh, which is very nice because he is the one who tries to get us into land. So when you stand here and control this and lean over to these ones, which are the front propellers, you can just aim yourself in and just nicely and snugly get into land. Without having to contact the machine department. Yeah. <laughs> which is very nice because otherwise it's just back and forth. No, don't do that! Um, 
phone! Come on, could you not? <laughs> it's a bit easier with this. I have a feeling you've been doing this. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm, uh, I'm only a history guide, alas. Yeah. Um, but I have, uh, I have um, guided on the boat when we are taking trips as well. Mm. Uh, and I find it very fun to watch the captain uh, working up here sometimes. Yeah. And especially when we're then going into land and just looking at him being super concentrated and just like, okay, we're going into land, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> our old captain was um, not quite as careful as our current one. So it was always like, you, you saw land and you were like, oh no, okay. <laughs> because he would just go, dunk. <laughs> and we were like, could you just slow down? <laughs> Mm. But our current captain, he prefers going very slowly and nicely. Yeah. But then our current captain also has been uh, driving, you know, really big boats out on sea. Okay. <laughs> so he has uh, some more experience. Cool. Thank you. Have you ever seen a radar like this? To see anything, you have to look down into it. Oh, we get to see the engine room as well. <laughs> and they are transport. Is this heavy water? No. <laughs> well, I mean, no, I'm fairly certain it's diesel or oil. Yeah. <laughs> Typical stairs down to engine rooms. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look at the diesels. <laughs> and there's three of them. So 750 horsepower each. Yep. And you also have the three uh, extra engines with uh, yeah. 350 each. 350 each. And yep. they are for the side propellers and... Uh, uh, these are for... Uh, one is for electricity. Uh, and then two are for if something happens with uh, the other ones. Okay, cool. Oh, here we have the same ones. It's not the RPMs. <laughs> <laughs> This room also has some smell, huh? <laughs> it does! It smells very good. <laughs> it's it's uh, us usually if I'm guiding and I have uh, I have both uh, some uh, men and their wives with, the men will be like, oh, look at all this! And the women will be like, well... <laughs> <laughs> I find it very funny. <laughs> yeah? I, I quite like the smell myself, but I'm a farmer person, so... Yeah. <laughs> I'm used, I'm used to engine smells and stuff, You're used to driving a tractor, not a boat, but stuff. Yeah, and back here we have all these switch panels or instruments. These look pretty modern. Yeah. You know if all these are original? Sure. I think most of them are original. Okay. Uh, some have been switched out because of. Uh, yeah. Well, they've been used up more or less. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much for a very pleasant guided tour. You're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's it for this episode. Next time we will go to Rukan and the hydro fertilizer factory in Vemork, where the heavy water was discovered. So please check back then. Please help me out by subscribing, liking and commenting on this video if you liked it. You may also support financially as a channel member right here on YouTube or go to patreon.com slash sailmermaid. You will get an ad free experience of my videos and get early access. Thank you to all my supporters in any way or form. 
A special thank you to my gold supporter, Harvey Engwert. Now, thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Bye bye.